Tonight's guest has explored the darkest corners of women's experience and has returned with news of hope, challenge, and change. And here now with more on that shift, Sally Armstrong, the author of The Ascent of Women, Our Turn, Our Way, A Remarkable Story of Worldwide Change. And it's great to have you back in this studio. I'm happy to be here. Can we do a little family business before we start? Well, before we get what to the book. In mind? <laughs> well, what's your son's name who works at CBC? Peter Armstrong. Right. I hear him on the radio from time to time. You do. Who's he married to? Pia Chattopadhyay. I'm sorry, that name again? <laughs> Pia Chattopadhyay. And what does she normally do for TVO? Well, she, she comes in when you can't come in, I guess. Uh, and, and does the summer. She does the summer edition. When she's not pregnant. Oh, yes. So I'm here interviewing Pia's mother-in-law because Pia decided to go have twins. That's right. Identical yeah. twin boys. Isn't that phenomenal? It doesn't get more exciting than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, your family's gain is also my gain because I'm happy to be able to sit across the table from you. In fact, didn't I tell you this when it was even a secret? I think you, I whispered to you at a journalism uh, event. Sally, I can't believe you're telling this because <laughs> I actually kept that a secret. Oh, did you? I went oh. to Pia, actually, and said to her, I know you're pregnant, even though you haven't told anybody yet. She said, how do you know? And I said, I never give up my sources. And you were my source. <laughs> and now you've given yourself up. Okay, let's... Let's talk about this book, which I have to tell you is one of the most difficult things I've ever read in my life because your stories at the beginning are horrendous. Some very tough, brutal material on the lives of women in some very unpleasant parts of the world. And yet your conclusion is there are signs of positive change everywhere. How is it that you can come to that conclusion based on the first 150 pages of what you write? You know, you have to tell the truth if you want to get people to believe the truth. Mm -hmm. And the, the truth is there are horrific things that happen to women and girls all around the world, including, by the way, in Canada. And yet, there's massive change going on right now. About three years ago, I began to realize the earth was shifting under the status of women. You know, I'm a journalist. I work in zones of conflict. Mm -hmm. I cover what happens to women and girls. The earth was shifting. I couldn't put my finger on it. I worried maybe it was wishful thinking. But I did the research. It's not wishful thinking. It's happening. Women are, as you and I sit here today, turning a corner, maybe even going toward a tipping point. As we sit here today, you say, which means that if we were sitting here 10 years ago, my hunch is you could not have called this book Ascent of Women. No, you couldn't have. Two years ago, you couldn't have called it Ascent of Women. Hmm. But today, you think we can. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So let's get through this. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, the, what's the first significant overarching evidence you would point to su to suggest that women are now ascending? You know, the women's movement as we knew it was a Western movement. But that is the, is the first significant change. And I refer to that as deception and disease. Let me explain. In the 1990s, the rise of Islamism made Asian women realize they'd become the target of extremists. They had to form a group, and they did. It's called Women Living Under Muslim Laws. They are smart, they're savvy, they're doing research that's never been done before. They have brought Asian women together. In Africa, let's move to disease. The HIV AIDS pandemic made women in Africa realize, they said to me, they, they can't say no to sex. They said, we'll all be dead if we don't do something. Mm -hmm. So they banded together. So now you have women in Asia, women in Africa, women in the Americas coming together. And what happens? The internet jumps into action. Facebook, Twitter, blogging comes to life. I know how that works when it comes to uh, starting the revolution, but how does that work in this case? Because the women started talking to each other, and women wearing hijab found out that despite what the fundamentalists told them, when women wearing jeans were not all whores. And women wearing jeans found out that despite what they'd heard, women wearing hijab were not all subjugated and oppressed. And probably, Steve, the worst thing that ever happened to fundamentalists, extremists, and misogynists was the day those women started talking to each other. They ripped the lid off the secrecy. And you think it's, well, I should ask, do you think we are inalterably headed in a direction which cannot be reversed? Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, as I look at revolutions around the world elsewhere, people said that, right? A year and a half ago in Egypt, they said, history's arrow is pointing towards an Egyptian democracy and history can't be turned back. If you look at Egypt today, a lot of people would argue that history's been turned back. Are you sure you can sit here and say the arrow isn't going to be turned back? You look at any revolution, 
and it didn't proceed in a way that was very different to the way it's proceeding in the Middle East today. Mm -hmm. They always move like that. What is that old theory about uh, uh, who, en who ends up leading the people? Not the person who started the revolution, because that person's so busy managing the revolution, another leader comes around and delivers to the people what they promised they'd deliver in the mm -hmm. first place. But with the women talking, all of this is changing. You know, they're asking questions they never asked before. They're saying, where is it written in the Quran that my daughter can't go to school? It's not in the Quran. Hmm. Where is it written that I can't go to work? It's not. They're saying, what else have you fooled me about? Women in Senegal are saying, why do we practice female genital cutting? They don't call it uh, mutilation, they call it cutting, excision, they speak French. Hmm. And the imams and the village chief said, it's our culture, it's our religion. They said, where is it written in our religion? Well, as it turns out, it is not. And, and that is practiced by Christians, Muslims, and even a Jewish sect in Ethiopia. It's not written in any holy book. So they said, so you claim we're, we do it because it's our culture. Who is it helping? Well, as it turns out, nobody. So the women of Malikunda Bambara said, that's it. We're not doing it anymore. 7,000 villages followed suit. It's because people are talking. Let's go to Kenya. We'll do some examples here. Kenya, a group of 160 women have banded together to do something different. Tell us about what they're doing. Steve, this is a spectacular story. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because this is another example of what would never have happened three, four years ago. These little girls, between the ages of three and 17, are suing their government for failing to protect them from being raped. And you know there's a Canadian sidebar to this. The, the, the case began here because this is the country where women sued the government for failing to protect them and won. Remember the Jane Doe case with the balcony rapist. Mm. So the Kenyan human rights lawyers came to the Canadian women human rights lawyers and said, how did you do that? They said, this is how we did it. It's a constitution challenge and we'll help you to do it. So the case, everyone says they'll win, you know. Everyone I interviewed said they'll win because there's all the laws you want in Kenya but there's total impunity for men. Oh, no, the laws they, are there, but no one follows them. They don't arrest, yeah. they don't convict, they don't do anything. So in the meantime, rape is on the rise. Do you know there's this demented view in sub-Saharan Africa that having sex with a little girl will cure you of HIV AIDS? And grandfathers are raping their grandchildren, granddaughters, as exactly. a result. Exactly. What is with that? Exactly. Where, where, where does that idea start? It's the impunity thing. And, and that's what you have to bust up. If, if you're going to move forward, and once women start talking, imagine these young girls going to court. And as much as they're victims of rape, they're very empowered when they talk about that little girl, Emily, only 11, raped by her grandfather, and she said, I'm taking the old man to the high court. They know there, there needs to be justice. And uh, they claim this is going to create a hullabaloo of Shakespearean proportions, nothing I like well, better. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, if they win, what do you think that portends? They will alter the status of women and girls in Kenya, maybe all of Africa, because everyone's going to be talking about it. The, you know, the case went to court in October, and we're expecting a decision very soon. I shouldn't say we. I'm only the messenger here, but I'm pretty keen on the case. And you're not concerned about a backlash? Of course there'll be a backlash. There's always a backlash. As you mentioned earlier, in Egypt there was a backlash. There's always a backlash. But you have to be prepared to chase the backlash. In Canada, when women decided to change the status quo, back in the 60s, 70s, and particularly the early 80s. There was backlash, but you have to deal with the backlash. Here is some of what we learned from your book. Let's bring this up if we can, Control Room. In Kenya, a girl child is raped every 30 minutes. 25% of Kenyan girls aged 12 to 24 lose their virginity due to rape. And more than 90% know their assailant fathers, grandfathers, uncles, teachers, priests. You've already told us there are laws on the books designed to prohibit this. Why are the laws failing to be enforced? Because historically, men have had impunity. Historically, we've looked on rape as the lot of, of women. You know, soldiers rape and pillage, and in a more modern version, Steubenville, Ohio, for example, boys will be boys. Mm. We've, we've always put it as a woman's uh, stone to bear. But you know, with women talking, they're, they're, they're realizing that the perpetrators have counted on shame to keep these women quiet. And the shame isn't for the woman, it's for the perpetrator. And now the women are saying that. Well, you, okay, but the 
in a lot of those cultures, the, sh the shame is not in the perpetration of this evil act, it's in being the victim of this evil act. And I, uh, you know, do you see evidence that people are starting to regard being a victim of rape as not as shameful as it once was? I do, exactly. Let's go back to the 160 girls. The day their case went to court, the lawyers walked from the shelter where the girls are to the court in Meru. And the girls said, we're coming with you. The lawyer said, you can't come with us. We have to hide your identity. You're, you're under age. You, you're victims. You, you. They said, and I can't remember the words in Swahili, but in Swahili they said, this is our story. We're going to tell it. And they joined them, and they marched to the court. And amazingly, there were so many people marching in the street that the, the guards at the courthouse closed the gates, thinking something ghastly was going to happen. And these little girls kept shouting out in Swahili, this is our story, we're going to tell it. And they stood with their hands on the, the gates. It was really remarkable. And then finally somebody explained, this is a case, open the gates, and, and in they went. These girls are willing to go public. It's, uh, it, it's not a matter of suggesting that people go public, but counting on shame is the way these people have managed to get away with this. Where do the girls get the guts to do this? Well, exactly. Now, it is a test case, so there is a, a lot of support. But I looked at them and I thought, 160 little kids are doing what diplomats couldn't do, what judges couldn't do, what the United Nations couldn't do. Mind you, young people tend to turn the world around when they decide to. They do. Now, you talked to a magistrate there as well, right, who was reluctant to prosecute. How come? Well, now, she claimed to me that she couldn't prosecute unless those kids had their facts straight. She said it's easy in a court for someone to trip up young kids. My question was, why do the kids have to be there? In our courts, they don't have to be there. And indeed, because of the Canadian women working with the Kenyan women lawyers, they did establish the fact that they presented the full case, but the girl would tell the lawyer the story out of the court, and they had to deal with those facts in front of the judge. Mm. But the magistrate said, I cannot convict unless she will stand up and say, that man over there did this to me. Um, they're doing it behind closed doors now in the court, but the child still has to say it. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, something else I learned from your book. I always knew the story of Rosa Parks, the woman who got on the bus and refused to go to the back of the bus. What I didn't know was that she had a history of anti-rape activism, and it does I guess raise the question of that whole history of sexual violence, the whole history of rape. Uh, you know, I, I read a lot of history. Why isn't that in the history books that I read? It's astonishing, is it not? This new book, The Dark at the End of the Street, exposes all these truths that only came out last year. Why didn't we know this before? All we know, as you said about Rosa Parks, was she's that iconic woman who refused to get off the bus in the Jim Crow Alabama days. And yet, for 20 years, she'd been analyzing rape as the, as the role that it played in the civil rights movement. The author of the book says you have to rewrite the civil rights movement story hmm. to include this. Why do you think we're, I mean, why have historians not told that story? You know, it's the same old thing. Oh, it's only women, you know, rape, pillage, is part of the soldier's life. Boys will be boys. It's because I feel that the raping of women was not seen for the crime it really is until recently. Look at the other book that came out at the same time as the Rosa Parks book about the sexual assault of Jewish women during the Holocaust. That book is hard to read. Mm. It burns your fingers as you turn the pages. It is so terrible. And yet the judges at Nuremberg knew about it and didn't want it in the courts. Gloria Steinem said to me the judges uh, claimed that they didn't want bawling women in the courtroom. Hmm. And, and leaders said they didn't want that known about their women. So if we'd known the Rosa Parks story, if we'd known what was happening in terms of rape to, to the Jewish women during the Holocaust, would it have altered the way we looked at, at uh, Bosnia, at Rwanda, at Congo? Probably it would have. Mm -hmm. But to me, the fact they suppressed that is an incredible example. Of uh, okay, you think it was an, uh, this, so this was not an error of omission. This was, a, a, you believe, a definitive error of commission to I suppress do. those stories. If the judge at Nuremberg said, I don't want my court full of bawling women, hmm. that's no mistake. It, it just wasn't seen as important enough to bring it up. 
since then, how has the discussion around uh, sexual violence, in your view, changed? And let's give a for instance here, for example, at war crimes tribunals today. Well, we can even go more recent than that. Look at Jyoti Pandey in India, that young woman who was raped to death. And, and uh, her story went around the world. What her story did was it ripped the lid off 50 years of secrecy in India. Here we have the fastest growing democracy in the world, and now we have a story about how the women are being treated. The women, those courageous women, are now on the street. They're marching, they're demanding change, and that's how you get change. It was the women in Bosnia who went to the war crimes tribunal in The Hague. And you know, Steve, to tell what happened to you, especially if you come from a family that is going to reject you for being raped, people tend to reject you for being raped. For those women in Bosnia to go to The Hague was extraordinarily courageous. Let's just understand that. It, it, it's, it's not enough that you've suffered the indignity of being raped, but your own family is probably going to reject you because they think that you've somehow become damaged goods now. That's right. How do you get past all that? Well, I don't know how you get past it. You need a heck of a lot of su support to walk through it. <laughs> I was there when the story of the rape camps came out. I broke that story. And when I wanted to talk to those women, you know, finally one woman, Eva Penovich, made herself known to me because she was determined this story would get out. And she said, if you don't put a name to it and you don't put a place to it, then you're not serious enough about it. She said, I want to talk. But most of the women I talked to were terrified. They were terrified their families would find out or their families had found out and they felt they couldn't go home. Hmm. There's a lot of religious connotation with this. And to tell you the truth, I backed off with my interviews. I thought these are women in agony and retelling it is, is going to make the agony worse. So luckily for me, Eva Penovich came along and she wanted this story told. So. You, know, you say you broke the story, but you almost didn't break the story if I remember reading. Because you, I think, what, you pitched that to an editor it's who another, sat on it? Another example. Yeah. It wasn't seen. I, I was in Sarajevo doing a story on the, the, the effect of war on children. And I began to hear these stories about rape camps. And you know, as a journalist, first casualty of war is usually the truth. I thought, can't be. I mean, this is so horrible. This can't be. But by the end of the day, I heard it from more and more credible sources. I thought, this is happening. But you know, I was in the magazine business. I could rush this breaking news story to press in about three months. So I gathered up everything I could, names, mobile phone numbers, anecdotes. And when I landed back in Canada the next day, I gave it to a news agency. I said, give this to one of your reporters. This is an extraordinary story. What did he and do? It, it never ran. I called him back later, seven weeks later, and I said, whatever happened? And he said, oh, you know, it was a good story, but I got busy and I was on deadline and, you know, I forgot. I said, 20,000 women were gang raped, some of them eight years old, some of them 80 years old, and you forgot? Two days later, I was on the plane and I went back. It still took us three months to get it to our readers. But our readers went crazy. They wrote to the UN and... You did not name and shame the editor who sat on the story in the book. I never will because you, never you will. know why? Mm -hmm. I think every big news agency would have given me the same thing. Hmm. Women's stories were not important enough to cover. Now everybody would cover this story. Let me raise this, uh, this is a little ticklish here, but uh, you talk about child marriage, you talk about female circumcision, you talk about honor killings, and there are some in the West who have felt it's not really our position to oppose these things because that presupposes our moral superiority of the West and we can't really go to the developing world and say these things to these folks. Does our reticence to, to call it what it is, is, is that part of the problem here? Absolutely, I'm so glad you raised it. You know, we love our multiculturalism here. We celebrate it, we promote it, and we guard it and protect it. So for all these years, and especially when I go into these countries, the thugs in power are not exactly happy to see me on their worst nightmare. And they say to me, this is none of your business, the way we, we treat our women. You're not in our culture, you're not in our religion, it's none of your business. Well, what's happening to those women is in cultural, it's criminal, and it is so my business. And that was the, the accepted way of thinking here. People would say, well, that's the way they treat their women or their girls, it's not my business. It is so our business. This is appalling, and it's about time we talked about it. It holds them back. It damages their health. It ruins their economy. It's time we talked about it. 
Hey, just raise a, a side issue for me. Do you ever worry about your safety when you go to these places? Yes. Have you ever had like seriously good cause to worry that someone was going to do something? I mean, I can just imagine this very tall, striking, blonde journalist, very Western, showing up in some of the most godforsaken parts of the world and really giving these people hell. I made mm -hmm. it on the Taliban website once on the list of people to be eliminated, and I was so mad. They had George W. Bush, President of the United States of America, and all that stuff. I didn't even get a title. I was the big woman from Canada with the yellow hair. <laughs> the big, one, big woman from Canada like with the yellow hair. Yeah, yeah. That's not I, bad. I've, I've had a couple of scrapes. Mm. That you would rather not go into further detail? Well, I think it happens on those assignments. I was picked up by the Taliban once. I, um, I, I've had a couple of scrapes. They're not uh, easy places to work. Okay, moving on. The women of Malakunda Bambara in Senegal dealt with the issue of female genital mutilation. Tell the story. Well, this is this, it's another reason this book had to be written. It's not just a matter of nobody can stop this. And, and until those women, it was very hard to stop it. You know, there's a researcher called Jerry Mackey who went to see those women. He did all his work on the stopping of foot binding in China. And he found that the reason foot binding stopped was women came together, a small group, they formed what they called the Healthy Foot Society, and they took a public pledge. They said, I will never bind my daughter's feet and I will never allow my son to marry a girl whose feet are bound. And in seven years it was over. He said, when the women of Malikunda Bambara in Senegal stood up and said, never again, not my daughter, they did the same thing. You see, you can't go it alone, they'll ostracize you. You wouldn't be able to eat with the others or go to school with the others or wash with the others. You have to get together. And that's what the women did. And so many followed them. Uh, Senegal, they say, is on the verge of being the first country to be free of female genital cutting, they call it there. Mm -hmm. and, and many other countries are following suit. Um, Jerry Mackey says it'll be over in five years. I don't know. When I look at Somalia, I think it might take a little longer than that. And look at Egypt. Here you had this spectacular revolution. And you see all these young men and women on the public square, Tahrir Square, mm -hmm. and you realize that the women have almost all gone through FGM. So yeah. it, there's a lot of talk now. There's a lot of talk about what does this do for me? Don't, don't tell me this was good for my health. I'm paying a fortune as an adult because of what was done to me as a little girl. All my shillings I earn in the field are going to a doctor. And they're turning their backs on it. Let's, uh, in our remaining moments, talk about this. The women broke the taboo by speaking about their sexuality, and I wonder how important it is for women, especially in regions dominated by more traditional and conservative thinking, to put the issue of sexuality out there, on the table, open for discussion. You know, even in this country, it was considered bad manners, at the very least, uh, to talk about what went on behind closed doors. We were told in the 60s when we started demanding change in the status of women that we must be bad mothers, we must be horrible wives, we must hate men, all that baloney. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk, you take a chance. But women the world over now are talking. You know, I was in Congo. Uh, the women are hiding in the forest because the, the militias come in, they burn down the village, steal the livestock, rape the women, chase the men away. The women grab the kids, as usual, run to the forest where they think they can be safe. And now there's clutches of them living all through the forest. This is in North and South Kivu province. Those women, these are not exactly advantaged women. And they've come up, coined a phrase, silence is violence. This is extraordinary. Hmm. It's like over the world, the, the veil is lifted. And people are seeing for the first time what's wrong. And everybody is singing from that same book. Why do you think more women haven't responded? You told us earlier that there's the they are using the legal institutions available to them, in some cases, to end this. Why have they not responded with violence? Why have they not just simply killed their husbands or, or you know, grouped together to do that kind of thing, meet the violence with more violence? You know, when I came out of Congo, a, a, a person said to me, what do you really think should happen? I said, you should arm the women, which is a terrible <laughs> thing to do. No, women don't do that. They don't. It's not the way they respond. As a gender, it's not the way they respond. What's more, uh, women have a gun to their heads to start. So they have to be wily. They have to be smarter. If you look all the way back through history, 
um, I was reading, and, and I wrote about this in the book, a group of women who, who saw themselves as mystics because they mm -hmm. didn't dare say it was their own mind that was speaking this terrible truth. So it's been going on for a while. Indeed. Sally Armstrong, we're only halfway through. We're not letting you go yet because we've got more to discuss. The name of the book is Ascent of Women, Our Turn, Our Way, A Remarkable Story of Worldwide Change. And we're only halfway there. You want to come back and talk more, some more tomorrow? I'd love to. Let's do it. Sally Armstrong will join us again tomorrow night, and we hope you can too. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.